Okay, so this uh, video is going to go all the way through theory of four sex and behavior. I'll try and be quite concise. The first section looks at production investment. So this is how much an individual puts in energy and effort along the external thing. There's a term isomorphic gametes that's not in the course, but I think it's quite important. It is the fact that males and females have very different gametes. A male is just characterized as the origin of things as the small gamete, which is cheap, low investment, produce a lot of them and it doesn't contain a very large energy store. The female is the gamete which following fertilization, so fusion of the uh, nucleus of the male into the gametes, provides the energy store. It has a higher investment than the male. When we look at examples of fish, we'll see that actually with external fertilization, fish can produce tons of female, tons of eggs. But still, even in those occasions, the male puts less in that's kind of the difference. The small gamete is male, the big gamete to provide the energy source is female. Depending on the time of the actual time of gestation, though, depending on the type of gestation and parental style, the female has different investment in both. So I could just say in tiny Nemo, those hundreds of eggs here, didn't actually matter. I mean, it does if you're a child. It doesn't actually matter how many of them survive as long as one of them survives. If, however, you're a human, you might only have one child for the entirety of your life. So really, if you produce a child, you want it to survive. Female gamete investments. So female will always invest more gamete-wise in the offspring than males. So female investment. Um, the egg structure in non-mammals, so you have to make the uh, coat, so the shell of the egg, and then you can also make the, um, the energy store. That's the same in seeds. The female plant is producing your food store and your seed coat. Uh, in mammals, certainly placental mammals, so your eukaryotic mammals, for example, okay, um, they have to feed the offspring through the placenta using their own blood and nutrients to get rid of all the waste products and also carry it to um, parturition, so carry it to actually giving birth. So that increases your chance of all getting killed by a predator and kind of slows you down and ruins your pelvis so that you can grow your body. So investment, parental investments are costly, but increases the likelihood that you'll be able to produce an offspring and that they'll survive. There's actually a species of octopus that um, once the eggs are fertilized by the male, the female will stand in front of the cave where the offspring have been uh, put until the offspring are old enough to go and hunt on their own. In the meantime, she dies. She starves to death, fighting off predators and eating parasites to try and get to the cave. Um, so she only has one brood in her lifetime and she dies protecting them. But a lot of them survive, so actually, quite a good strategy for investment wise. This particular spider, Stegophora mentonini, um, it has fertilized eggs that it sits on top. As they hatch, they eat her from the bottom of her abdomen up until she has a hollow shell. She lets them, she is their first uh, mate. And you might have heard of spiders where the male is what's called a nuptial gift. He either brings a food packet for the female to eat or he mates, or if that's not enough, she eats him instead. Um, so you really have to think about how much these organisms are investing. But it's all because it helps their offspring to farm. Offspring can either be what are called K or R selected. We also call it K or R strategy. R selected are things like bacteria. They have a short generation of time. So if you take a single point in time and say, well, how long does it take for this offspring from um, its birth, so to speak, to be able to reproduce? In an R selected, that's not a long time. Once an offspring is born, another way of saying it is it matures very quickly, gets to sexual maturity, and is able to reproduce. It quite often reproduces early, but most R selected will only reproduce at once. It makes a lot of offspring, they're very small, it hasn't invested much in any particular offspring, even if it does invest a lot overall, as so many offspring it has. It doesn't really put a lot of parental care in, short of you know, dying. Um, so as the actual offspring develop, it doesn't put a lot of investment into them. And any particular given offspring, so it's in the Nemo scenario, any given offspring has a low chance of getting to maturity. Case selected are like us and elephants. Um, so they've got long generation time, so it takes a long time for them to be born to kind of get to maturity. They often reproduce later in life because of that, but they can reproduce for multiple different um, sessions, different years. They don't produce a lot of offspring, but they tend to be larger, 
they tend to invest more in insignificant strings, and that means that they have a higher strength pair and a higher chance of that particular offspring being maturity. Our selection tends to occur in unstable environments, so uh, things like bacteria in an HR jelly that hasn't yet been built to capacity, they will just divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. Very short generation time, very easy for them to mature, but they only reproduce once or twice. Case selection tends to be in stable environments, so us, elephants, uh, trees, these things. It takes a while for them to get to maturity, but when they do, they can reproduce for lots. So on the other hand, there's the location of fertilization. So you can either have the sperm and the egg meet inside the body or outside the body. Um, generally, if it's internal fertilization, it'll meet inside the body. So the benefits of this are that they, you're more likely to get fertilization because the sperm can be forced up, brought up towards the egg. And it's in a controlled environment inside the body. So just like in external fertilization, you can put away or get eaten. Um, this protection means a higher offspring survivability. But you have to actually find a mate. You then have to actually mate with them, which can take quite a lot of energy to transfer the gametes. So that's a bit of a waste of time if you don't have to do it. Um, external fertilization, you can produce tons of offspring really quickly. But every given egg, you know, you put it out into your spawning pool and then the tide just rips it away 50 miles away. So there's no other fish. What a waste. Uh, or a shark comes past and eats it, you know. Um, and it's not a very specific process. We talk a lot about sexual selection, but really, you're just chucking your eggs and sperm into a massive pool with everyone else's eggs and sperm. You're not really picking a mate, are you? So we should know what parental investment is, the amount of energy or parental care that a parent puts into an offspring to reach maturity. Uh, we've looked at sperm requiring less investment than eggs, but you tend to introduce more sperm than eggs and you tend to have fewer eggs and sperm than you have an egg. So female investment is almost always higher than male investment, uh, even just in well, in terms of gamete production. Females have to make something that has a protective layer and that has an energy store, whereas males can just make the sperm. Shoot it off, and that's it. Non mammals uh, that's the case. In mammals, females also have to have gestation inside their body, which is a big energy effort. Um, classification of organisms as R strategists or R selected, who have short generation times um, and produce a lot of offspring, but they don't often reach survival or maturity. In case selection, it takes a while to get to maturity, but you can make quite a few different uh, mating attempts. And several attempts at raising children. You have to put more parental care in. Costs and benefits of external and internal fertilization. So external, um, you can make a lot of gametes, but any given gamete is unlikely to survive. Whereas internal, it's a big energy investment, so you have to make some. 4B, uh, so 4B, reproductive behaviors and mating systems in animals. We're going to look at mating systems, but that's the easiest place to start. Yeah, um, easiest place to start. So. Mating systems, when they talk about that, they are talking about uh, these four terms here, monogamy, polygamy, polygyny, and polyandry. So mono means one in these words, so one um, set, multiple set, poly, multiple. Gammy is kind of talking about the gametes, so the number of um, individuals you're mating, uh, mating with. Gyne is female, which is like gynecology, and andry means male. Um, interestingly, in zoology, gynandromorphism is the presence of both male and female um, functional um, sexual organs or cells in mating. So monogamy is a mating pair that exclusively mate just with each other, not their own lovers. So that's within a single breeding season. So 2021, this is a monogamous pair. 2022, you can have a different monogamous pair. So this female can find a different male. To be a monogamous pair during that mating period. Polygamy um, or polygamy, individuals of one sex have more than one partner. So it could be males with multiple female partners, which is called polygyny. Quite often we would call this a harem, but it's not a harem, of course. Or females with multiple male partners. So if you think about it, this is an example of both polygyny and polyandry, because this is just a semen cloud and an egg cloud. So you don't know how many males you've mated with as a female, or how many females you've mated with as a female. 
there's quite a lot of squash into the next few slides, but it's all kind of, of a theme. Um, so a lot of animals use um, mating rituals to select their mates. Usually it's female choice. So courtship behaviour in birds and fish, we tend to have what's called species-specific sign stimulus and a fixed action pattern response. These are need-to-know words from the course. They, they're a lot simpler than they look. If, as a fish or a bird, you um, create a stimulus for the other party, so you're a colour or you have a smell or a sound or a taste, even, who knows, or touch, that the other party will then have a standard response to, then that's a species-specific sign stimulus. So if you are this bird here, bird of paradise, I think, that male pattern, that male stimulus, will have the female give a fixed response. So she will maybe say, well, I'm rather miss and run off, or she'll wait, or she'll make a good display, or she'll turn around and present. Any of these things can happen. That's a fixed response to that particular sign stimulus. Or, uh, males, stickleback having a red belly, and blue and white is back, that meaning they're ready to attack. So that's how other males will uh, see this. Whereas males that see a female who is uh, grayish green with a swollen silver belly, they know that particular sign, specific stimuli, um, means they want to court and mate. So it's just this stimulus giving you a fixed response from the other party. In sexual selection, this is characteristics that are selected for that don't give a survival advantage. It's not really natural selection. Um, so they just make you more attractive and make you more likely to be able to mate. So a good example of this is tail length in this particular group of birds. It looks like these birds here, predators aren't able to catch onto them because they have quite small tails, but none of the females find them attractive. The males here have lovely long tails, all the females find them attractive. But they never get a chance to mate with them because predators have caught onto that lovely tail by the time they get to maturity. You want to be somewhere in between. This is what we would have called stabilizing selection at five. You have to be somewhere in between not having anything of a tail and if it's too long a tail. So survival advantage by natural selection is pressure here, and sexual selection is pressure here. Female choice. Um, many species exhibit sexual dimorphism as a product of this sexual selection. So the females are quite inconspicuous because they're trying to avoid the natural selection of predation. And also it costs a lot of energy to make this absolutely pretty, just using protein and genes. It's a massive waste of energy and protein. And whereas males have to in order to mate. So mating is the most important thing in biology for them. Um, so they have these very conspicuous structures for reproductive markings, which allow them to reproduce. When we look at honest stimuli, this is, or honest signals, this is an honest signal. Reverse sexual dimorphism is just something we've chucked into the course. Um, it's where a behaviour or phenotype we would expect in a female is shown in the male or vice versa. So in certain kinds of grouse, the female, once the egg is fertilised, does not sit on it. The male sits on it. Penguins. The female in that particular grouse species goes off and mates with another male. And then once he's tied down looking after her egg, she'll go and find another one. And she'll mate with as many different males and make them sit on the egg as she possibly can in that mating season. Or in um, seahorses, where, because remember, the female, all that means is they have the gametes, they produce the gametes that has the energy store. So this female produces a slightly larger gamete than the male, it's got an energy store. She transfers it across after it's been fertilized to the male spout, and he will do the parental care, and she will go off and do that in her own course. Female choice involves females possessing what's called an honest signal. This is something that indicates that the male you're looking at has a high chance of survival, the offspring you produce with him is likely to survive, and that he's probably got quite a low, he's quite a healthy individual, a low parasitic type. This gentleman here, for example, there is no chance he's wide about predators. Look at that tail. He's also probably not getting parasites. So again, look at that beautiful tail. And if he's able to put that much energy into having a beautiful tail, he's probably got a great little um, layer, whatever the term is, somewhere which he can raise your off. You can raise your off. So this is a really good honest signal that has a high quality male. Just like having a tail that long means that you're clearly uh, really, really big and strong and tall and strong. 
So that's an honest signal. Yeah, we're almost done. Last quote, a little bit. In liking species, males gather to, to it at what's called the lek. So these are little raised areas where the males will stand and they will sing a song or show off their red belly or something. And the females wander through like they're an art gallery while the males stand and present and they'll pick a male that they like. Because it's the male and they can just deposit semen, they will mate with the male and then they'll bimble off and see if actually maybe they've missed out on a better male that they can also mate with. Um, so you can have polygyny and polyandry here as well. Um, this is dominant males tend to occupy the centre of the leg. There's no real point in the subordinates being at the centre, and um, they'll be fought off by the bigger, more attractive males. So the um, the less kind of attractive males or the juveniles will sometimes still lick at the outside um, of the circle. So they're unlikely to get a female to mate with somebody. Um, there used to be sneak mating, which is in the course that we took out. So some males who have no chance of ever getting to the leg um, have don't have the normal poly um, so don't have the normal sexual dimorphism. They look like a female. They wander around with the females and then sneak mate when no one's paying attention. So either the females have laid their eggs and they will mate with the egg, or they'll take their eggs to the female when no one's looking. This. Um, Lacking behaviour stops any kind of conflict because there's no fighting. It's just the most attractive males sing the best song. Nobody has a fight, and they get to mate. Uh, so it reduces a lot of danger from physical altercation, like this. I mean, obviously there are uh, species like foxes, like dogs, like deer, like bears that will have a physical display, a real conflict. Um, but if it can be ritualised, like a lick then it's just a lot safer and requires a lot less energy. Um, both ritualised and real mate, um, conflicts between males will increase access to the females for the winning male. So it's worth participating in these conflicts because if you win, you get access to a larger number of females. Uh, males will fight for dominance and access to females using elaborate weapons such as antlers, tusks or horns. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, please do ask your